can show you an example here. In Microsoft Teams, you know, say you're in your, your development group or in a class group and you share a document or you create a document. So I can go to our files tab here, go to new, and I can create any number of these documents. I'm not using the word application, but you could still use the word application if you'd like. So if I click on new, I can name the document. And this opens up Microsoft Word right within Microsoft Teams. There's no need to get a separate application. There's no need to do anything else. I have the familiar editing tools. And I have something else called conversation. This conversation tab allows me to actually chat with people that are in the same team. And that way, these people can work on this document with me at the same time. So imagine, you know, that you're working on a document with your group or with your class and you, you want to see real time feedback. You can use this right within the, the Teams application, or you can use it within web, the web application, or right within Microsoft uh, Word. And you can do that by again clicking on the document, and then you'll see that the chat is enabled right here, or this little helpful function called Open in Desktop App is enabled. Once you do that, it opens up the Microsoft Word document. And again, you're able to use the same type of app and it's working together with others. Bye -bye, All right. Now, as soon as I created this Word document, something happened within my Microsoft Teams. Inside of the channel that I'm in, it posts that I've actually created this team or this document, and everyone else can work on it by simply clicking on this uh, document here. And again, it defaults to the Microsoft Teams environment of Word, but you can always open the desktop app. You can also open it within the browser or download the document right here. This works for any of the Microsoft applications. If you wanted to create a new Excel file, a new PowerPoint file, a new forms for Excel, or even a OneNote, it can be worked on by the entire university at the same time. One of the questions is how many people can actually work on a document at the same time? And that number actually um, if the Microsoft team wants to back me up or they have an exact number, but that number isn't actually defined because there can be a lot of people working at the same time on a document. And then the other thing that people ask is, you know, if I'm editing the same line with another person, who wins? You know, who, when I, when someone else makes the edit and I'm making the edit at the same time, you know, who, who exactly wins? And it really is the person who gets there first. Um, there's no way to define, you know, who gets there first. It's really based on your internet connection. But if you guys are familiar, there is version history. Each document has a versioning history, which can be accessed on the desktop app or on SharePoint. And so if you see a different version, you can always open that version and modify it. And that way you can keep track of all the edits and the version history is created every time someone makes an edit, including yourself or someone else. So, you know, imagine when you're, you're doing your synchronous learning or teaching um, or working with a colleague and you want to know like who made what edit, you can go ahead and do that um, right on Word. And again, this is available for any application, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and OneNote.
One of the other main things people do is they work one-on-one -on -one with other people. Perhaps you don't need to communicate within an actual team and you just want to message someone one-on-one -on -one or initiate a group chat. If you go to chats here on Microsoft Teams, you again can initiate a chat between a person. So I have Omar here. I can initiate the chat by giving them a document or attaching something here from my OneDrive. OneDrive is integrated within Microsoft Teams. So I can attach a document here. And this is automatically shared between just Omar and myself. So once we start working on it, we're the only ones who have access and we're working on it together within a private environment. I can also initiate a video call, an audio call, and just sharing my screen. I don't actually have to initiate a call for this. I can simply share a portion of my screen or the entire screen to Omar in case I need a quick edit. So again, this is very useful for when you know, you're talking with a colleague about you know, next week's class or, or the class that's coming up and you need to share something from your screen. Just look up that colleague within search, bring up the group chat, and then share the screen. No need for calling them or initiating a video call. If you do share the screen and you want to initiate a call after, you can just simply click on call and it will initiate that. If you want a couple people instead of just Omar, you can quickly add someone from the group chat. So for example, I'm adding Omar and then another student. It combines into one group conversation, and then I can share my files and do whatever I need to do from this perspective. All right, so just as a recap, you can use Microsoft Teams to create meetings with synchronous tools like Whiteboard, Word, PowerPoint, Excel. And then you can also create private instances between people. So between one person, between a group, and you can use the calling function, video function, and sharing function as well. All right. So there are a couple tools that you can also use online that'll help with your learning. So I'm going to go ahead and open up a new browser here. And I'm going to go to office.com. Office.com is just your landing page for everything Microsoft. So one of the tools we went over last week, which is a very helpful synchronous tool, is called Microsoft Forms. Microsoft Forms is a function that allows you to create quizzes, group forms, understanding forms, check-in forms, any kind of form that you might think of to engage others, um, Microsoft Forms can help. So one of the areas that we want to cover is, you know, how to create a new form versus a new quiz. Microsoft Forms already has a template for both. So within a form, you're able to name the form. You know, um, we can call it check-in. You can add a description or add a photo. And again, the photo can be taken from Bing. So I can just put, you know, something like Texas beautiful image from Texas, and I can add that here. And that'll just add some uh, pictures and descriptions. And again, it's always great to add um, accessibility features and think of that as a forward thinking proposition instead of something after the fact. So Microsoft Forms makes it really easy to input alternate text. A picture of Texas. And forgive me, I'm not 100% familiar with where this is in Texas. So if someone wants to um, let me know where this is, uh, that would be awesome. 
but you know, you click enter there and you have the alternative text on that picture. Thank you, Austin. You enter a description. And then within the form, you can add new things. So Microsoft Forms gives you simply a choice. You can add a text box, a rating, so like or dislike. You know, the rating can be one star, five stars. And then you can add more things like a date, a ranking, a Likert. Um, so Likert or Likert is uh, um, a, a, a way to gauge sentiment. So for example, you know, statement one and statement two, how, how, you know, how much do you identify with statement one? How much do, I, do you identify with statement two? You can add more options, you can add more statements. So this would be a great way to gauge sentiment as well. And with each Microsoft form, by the way, you can create required or not required options meaning in order to proceed forward and actually enter or complete the form, this person needs to um, actually answer the question or not. So you can go ahead and do that within the required item here. You know, other things you can put in are a promoter score as well. So a promoter score is a very good way to gauge, you know, how students or how staff or how faculty think of your form or think of the thing that you're trying to get across. They can add a, a, a net score um, tool as well. And then um, more, you can even add a file as well or even another section. So you can add multiple sections within the form. So the top here is section one, the bottom here is section two, and I can add a file as well. So a folder is created in OneDrive, and then um, you can upload that file after you ask the question. So for example, just say, you know, what do you think of this um, video or form? Once you add that, you can add a picture. You can uh, create the file size limit, and then the student can upload the file uh, for you to evaluate. So this is a great way to, you know, say, you know, upload homework one and then upload it right over here. So you could use that as an example. Now, other things that you can do with forms that is not not truly apparent is you can branch things out. So, for example, if I have a question here and I wanted to add something to it, you know, there's more to this statement analysis than just this one question. There's something called branching. Branching allows you to add multiple things or go to another section. So for example, from question three, once you answer that question, I want you to go straight to the end of the form, or I want you to go to, to, go to another question. I want you to go to question, uh, let's see, section two. I'll just do that for example. So you can do that as well and branch off your questions. Now someone asked, can I organize my forms into folders? So just to clarify a little bit, I think what you're talking about is, can I organize you know, all of these forms into an actual folder? Is that what you're asking? Yes, thank you. Great, awesome. So yeah, you can um, you can create a sort of folder structure, but it's not as simple as you know um, creating a form and then creating a folder. Uh, it, it's under this tab right here called Group Forms, and Group Forms are correspondent to like a a group within Microsoft or like a team group. So if you create a form within that team group, it'll be organized by uh, the group here. So for example, if I click this, this pertains to biology 47. It's lecture one, quiz one. Um, anytime I create a new form for biology uh, 47, they're going to be grouped right here. And as you can see, 
I'm able to switch between different groups here. And these groups correspond to Microsoft Teams. So I hope that helps um, answer that question. Awesome, thank you. Thanks for that question. And you know, once I'm in that group, I can create group forms and group quizzes at the same time, uh, straight to that group. I can also see who's part of this group as well. All right. The next part of Microsoft um, Forms, which I won't go over because it's the same thing, but is a quiz. The quiz is um, added as the same as almost the same thing as a form, but it um, has more um, timely functions for quizzes. You know, quizzes are more of a choice based system rather than, you know, a net promoter score, for example. So it just gives you a choice uh, first. Now I mentioned, you know, this is for synchronous learning. So how is forms, you know, part of that synchronous learning um, object objective? Well, again, once you create the quiz and insert it in something like a video or a, a Teams channel, you can see the live responses by going to responses. Now, once I go to responses, I can see, you know, how many responses I got and uh, the average time it took to complete. And I can open those results and search by student or by faculty member, whoever responded. Another useful feature within Forms to make it truly live is using Forms within Microsoft Teams. So for example, in a meeting that I join or that I organized, so I'm just going to go ahead and join this meeting, in the chat, I'm actually able to use the forms function as a live part of my meeting. So, you know, say you're having a faculty meeting or a student meeting and you can add a app to the meeting. One of the apps is called forms. Once you add this app, um, oh, not supposed to go wrong, but once you add this app, we'll see if that happens if it, if it doesn't that's fine you just need to restart but once it happens um, i added this last time you can create a poll within the microsoft teams meeting it's uploaded right there live all the students or all the faculty get a notification you can create a quiz or create a form ask a question once a person votes you'll notice that down here the results will, uh, are updated live. That way you can get instant feedback in your conversation or your meeting. So this is a great way to use Microsoft Forms as a synchronous tool. And you can see when the form was updated. All right. So again, using Forms as a tool on its own or integrated within Microsoft Teams is a great way to get um, feedback at either live or, you know, at another time. All right, so we're at 1230 and I wanted to go over some more tools, but if anyone has any questions, go ahead and please paste them in the chat or um, come off of mute and ask them over what we've gone over so far. So just to recap, we went over using Microsoft Teams using um, the recording tool, the whiteboard tool, um, some of the Office apps, and then Microsoft Forms. Go ahead. Oh. Kathleen, do you have a question? No. OK, got it. No. All right. OK, so if there are no questions for now, remember you can always post them in the chat. We're going to go over the OneNote tool. So OneNote is another great way to engage in synchronous learning. And you, you might think that, oh, is it just a notebook? Actually, no, you have many tools within OneNote um, that can help. So OneNote has several functions. OneNote is completely saved to the cloud, so it's always saved to OneDrive, meaning you can access it from anywhere. 
And then OneNote also serves as a personal notebook repository and a class repository as well. Um, and then you can think of class as either your students or a faculty as well, um, faculty or admin groups. So it doesn't need to be just a student class. So for example, if I create a new notebook, I'm not gonna create a new one, I'm just gonna open one of these. Um, so if I create or open, for example, a school notebook here. OneNote opens up and is able to give me a view of sections and pages. Within OneNote, there are many useful features, but what I really like about OneNote is the ability to just start taking notes. And then organize uh, different things within OneNote, like tables, different languages, and other types of immersive things. Uh, Dr. Suleiman asks, can we create mathematical equations in Microsoft Forms? You definitely can copy and paste them in, for example, a, um, a text box or a single question type of form, uh, but creating them natively is not available in Microsoft Forms. However, um, we're on the right application because it's available in OneNote. So, you know, that's a great uh, segue into the insert insert tab here. So, you know, I have a page here. So let's go to an untit untitled page here. And I'm able to name the page. So, you know, say I can name it math equations or math. Let's just do math. So I'm able to type in notes. If I have pen input on my device, I can even write um, with a with a drawing tool like my pen. Right now I'm using it from the browser, so I don't have the input, but I can do something like that with my pen. I'm able to change the page into different options, like different page colors. So if that's better for me, I can do that. I can also change uh, the page type into, you know, a, um, a lined page or a grid page, I can change that as well within the app here. So another tool, which is in all Microsoft apps like Word, PowerPoint, Excel, something called Immersive Reader. So if I have students who are accessibility minded or faculty who are accessibility minded, I have the Immersive Tool Reader which we briefly went over in another session, but I'm going to go over one more time. So my immersive tool reader has segmented out everything within OneNote, and I'm able to do things like syllabize everything, so put in syllables, uh, differentiate the different parts of speech, and then really what's helpful is increase or decrease text size. Increase spacing if I need to, and create a more accessible color scheme uh, to my page. Once I've set all that up, I'm able to press play here, and the tool will read back whatever text there's in uh, the OneNote, or whatever text is in, in Word or PowerPoint or Excel. Any of the Microsoft tools have the Immersive Reader application. And if I need to, I can even do something called line focus, which focuses on the individual line or lines. And then, of course, translation is a hallmark of this feature. So, for example, if I need to translate into Spanish, I can go word by word within my translation. And if I click on a word, there's the actual translation and I can listen to the translation as well. And some words even have picture translations as well for those who understand better on a visual basis. Again, this is just one application between um, 
OneNote, Word, PowerPoint, Excel. This, this tool is available in all of them. All right, so from Immersive Reader, I also have other tools within OneNote that I can use. For example, I can insert files like a printout, attachments. I can insert pictures like cam from the camera, online, from the file. I can also do things, and this is super useful for synchronous learning, is actually record audio. So if I click on that, and I'll show you in just a moment, but I go ahead and click on audio and it uses my system microphone to actually record what's going on. And so once I do that and I stop, I'm able to play back the recording. And let's say during the recording I was typing. So during the recording, if I was typing something, it would actually type whenever or show me what I was typing during the seconds of that recording. And of course, you can't hear this because I'm presenting to you from two different computers, but this recording would be able to capture everything that's happening during the meeting or during the lecture, and then I'd be able to play it back as well. All right, so I'll go ahead and delete that. Now, one person asked about symbols and mathematical equations. Of course, OneNote is able to do something like that. So OneNote has many symbols that you're able to insert. And in the actual application, there's even more. But the math tool is very interesting within OneNote, and I highly recommend it. So you can write your equation within ink or type it using the keyboard. So I'm actually going to write it in ink, and I'll show you what I mean. So say I need help or I need to solve this problem. X plus three equals two. So I'm using a pen, but I could again use my keyboard or anything like that. I'm going to select the math button here. And whoops, I'm going to select the equation after I select. I'm actually I'm going to select the equation first. So with the rectangle tool here, I go ahead and select that. Oh, that's not that great. Let's try this. All right. Then I'm actually going to click on the math button here. And as you can see, it turns the equation into a math function. And so I can ink to math right here, which would create the equation right here within one note. And then I can even do things like solve for x right here. And it shows me, you know, x equals negative 1. And it shows me the steps to actually solving the linear equation. And there's that familiar immersive reader tool, which then creates an immersive experience for that. But more importantly, you know, you might think, hey, that's actually cheating. Um, students don't need to learn math anymore. Uh, no. So as a faculty member, you can do something called create a practice quiz. And this actually generates a form from Microsoft Forms where it creates a math quiz using the same concept of what you just solved, a linear equation. And then I'm able to insert this within the OneNote. So as you can see, you know, Dr. Suleiman, I know it took a little bit for me to answer your question, but the integration between Microsoft Forms and OneNote allows you to create cool forms like this within a OneNote. And again, this OneNote can be an individual notebook that you can share out, or you can just create one with a group that you're working with. It can be faculty, staff, or students. So let me quickly go over that. This school notebook, I kind of is my own, my own notebook right here. What about a notebook that's associated with a class? So when I create a new notebook, this is creating a private notebook. But I can just click on class notebooks right here. And I can see that I have notebooks associated with different groups. Now again, it doesn't need to be just a student group. This can be an admin group. But 
if I go ahead and go to the Biology 10 notebook, for example, this notebook is rooted in an actual class. What OneNote does is it creates sections and it shares it out automatically to the entire class. Meaning I don't need to, I don't need to, um, you know, click that share button all the time to create it with different people. I can just share it out. And now this is an example of a teacher's notebook or an educator's notebook where it's called a professional learning community and it automatically creates different objectives for you for your PLC community. So you have, you know, a planning notebook right here, a section, sorry, a check notebook, a log notebook. And this gives you different tools um, with your educators on how to actually use a PLC community within Microsoft OneNote. And it also gives you uh, free resources as well. So again, you have different types of notebooks. So, you know, for example, here's another example of a of a school notebook where this one is created for students. It's called a class notebook. And as you can see, right here is a list of everyone within the group. Each person has a notebook which the faculty member can add multiple sections. Um, so for example, I added a quiz section, class notes, handouts, homework, and hello. Again, this is just another tool that you can use within your ecosystem to create a learning experience for synchronous learning or asynchronous learning. I definitely like to use OneNote as a great tool for reviewing math or reviewing um, professional learning communities or just engaging on, on, a, on a level um, that I can have either synchronously or asynchronously. And again, really the best way to engage synchronously is through Microsoft Teams. Because what I can do is, you know, for every single class or, or, um, or team that I have, as you can see up here, the class notebook is located within Microsoft Teams. So I could literally have a meeting while having the class notebook open and at the editing topics together. All right. So we just went over quickly OneNote and uh, the different applications that OneNote has. Are there any questions regarding OneNote? I know that's not, not too deep within OneNote, but um, it is an overview of what it can do. All right. So there are multiple other apps that you can use within uh, the Office ecosystem for synchronous learning. You know, one of them, again, we went over Whiteboard today. Uh, we went over Word and PowerPoint and Excel. Uh, and then Teams as well, integrating all these together. Uh, Microsoft Forms, again, can be used for synchronous learning as well. And then um, OneNote. You know, OneNote is a, is a really a great tool to use for, for capturing uh, different um, projects and doing that either synchronously or asynchronously. And if you kind of take a look at your apps here, remember I divided OneNote within class notebooks, which is for students and then staff notebooks, which can be for the staff here. So you can collaborate with faculty and staff on a separate level within OneNote. So if you just go ahead and click that, it's going to, again, give you a great overview of staff notebooks within Microsoft's ecosystem. Uh, so you can manage your notebooks, add or remove staff members here, or just create a new staff uh, notebook here. And again, just to tie it all back together, you can use Teams to be a kind of landing point for everything. So you can have a class notebook here, you can have different tabs here that link to different documents, and then you can have uh, meetings as well. All right. So one ask that um, I had I had someone from the previous meeting ask me was, you know, are there is there a way to actually create breakout rooms within Microsoft's ecosystem? 
So I'm going to go over this pretty quickly, but, but there is a way to do that using Microsoft Teams. And so I'm just going to briefly show that and then we'll open into, uh, into questions. So if you wanted to use, you know, Teams for a conference or for um, a meeting which had multiple rooms, uh, you can easily do that with Microsoft Teams. So I think last time we discussed, you know, how to create a meeting within Microsoft Teams. So you can create a meeting and put it on a calendar and invite people via calendar. The best way to do breakout rooms is again, structure your team to have different channels. So in this instance, I'm uh, demoing a, a class, but again, just imagine that this was a faculty group or another type of group. And I have different channels for different things within the class. In each of those channels, I've scheduled a meeting that happens to be inside the channel. So if I was to schedule the meeting, I would again go to my calendar, click on new meeting here. And then once I add the title, you know, I can call it breakout room three. I don't need to add any attendees. I can just add a channel. So I can go to that biology uh, week three, and then I see the time is right, I'll just send. And now what happens is within the team channel, you can see I have that meeting here. So if I have the general meeting here, I can just simply join it. So I'm gonna just go ahead and show you this. And then I can just navigate back to the team as you can see, I'm in the meeting here, and then I can navigate to every single channel that I need to go to and join that other meeting. And as you can see, as I, as I join the meeting, right here I'll have a little notification that the general meeting is still going on, but I'm on hold. When, I need, when I'm done with my breakout room, I can simply go back and join the general meeting and then hang up on my breakout room. So it's pretty simple and you know, I'll give you an example. The University of Southern California, USC, uses um, breakout rooms in Microsoft Teams for um, lectures on um, what they call iPodia. It's like a general lecture class open to other universities within the world. And people all just join together into one Teams meeting and then they have five minute breakout sessions. Um, and this is all faculty, by the way. Um, so they're learning about tools to, to teach virtual. And so they join one big meeting together within Microsoft Teams, and then they go to their five minute discussions, then they come back, and then you know the five minute discussion is still here, and they can go back to the five minute discussion once the, the instructor says, okay, go, go to your five minute discussion. All right, so that's an example of, again, using breakout rooms within Microsoft Teams. All right, so just to recap again, um, today we learned about synchronous tools that you can use in the moment to teach. One of them was, again, using meetings within Microsoft Teams, uh, using Microsoft Forms, and different apps like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and OneNote. Uh, using the tool Microsoft Whiteboard to engage in actual uh, real-time whiteboarding at the same time. And then Whiteboard, again, can be used independent of Teams and with Teams. So, you know, everything I've actually shown you, you can use within a meeting within the Microsoft Teams environment. That way you're on video and audio at the same time, but you can also use it independently and you can use it with other tools like Zoom or other conferencing solutions that you might have. Um, because again, you can have the app open and you can work with people at the same time. So I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, if you have general questions or specific questions, let's go over that. So feel free to come off of mute or um, please post in the chat. And I saw someone said, what is the maximum of people that can be on during a video team meeting? Yeah, it's about 250 to 300. I believe we increased it to 300 for now, 
but um, 250 is the normal limit there. All right, one person asked, um, I had considerable difficult joining the meeting. Um, seems to be better from joining from the web. Uh, yes, uh, that, that is a good choice as well. Was the recording app utilized? Is it through Teams as well? Yeah, so Precious, uh, the recording app can be done in several different ways. Last week, we actually went over um, a great tool within Microsoft Stream. So for example, on Stream, and I'll show you right now, you're able to upload videos that you've recorded from a different source. So for example, um, if I create right here, I can upload video, but I can also just do a recording of my screen right here on Microsoft Stream. So again, this would be very useful if you know you have you have one thing that you need to record. Now, during a Microsoft Teams meeting, I can also do the same thing. So for example, if I'm on a Microsoft Teams meeting, I can just click on the three dots here under More Actions, and I have a recording button. This records everything that's happening on the Microsoft Teams meeting, whether it be you sharing your screen, whether it be just video call or audio calling, it'll record everything. And then where will it store it? It's gonna store it in Microsoft Stream. So for example, um, if I go to my content here, just go to videos to see all the videos that I'm associated with, um, I can see that, oh, here's the lecture, for example, and it's uploaded and there's a transcript that's been made and then I can add, you know, forms to it as well. So, you know, remember last week we went over how to add a form. So if I know the form URL or I don't, I can just go to Microsoft Forms and get a quiz, for example, that I want to add. I get the URL here. And then I paste the URL with into stream. I can name my form, check one. Select where I want to add it to the timeline of the video. And then once a student or once a faculty member or anyone gets to that point at the video, it'll change and go right into Microsoft Forms for them to answer. So there we go, it's changing. And now uh, the form will open up so that I can answer that. Awesome, thank you. All right, are there any other questions regarding, you know, what we covered today? All right, so let me give you a little preview for next week. Next week, we're going to look at more asynchronous tools. So for example, we'll look more deeper into OneNote, but then we're also going to a look into Microsoft Bookings. So Bookings is a great way for to schedule things like office hours. So I'll teach you guys how to use Microsoft Bookings to actually go in, create some office hours for yourself that align well to your calendar, and then share a link out or put a link within your email or on your website so that students, faculty, and other administration members or anyone within the public can book a time and get an automatic Microsoft Teams link to meet with you. So bookings will be a great tool um, to learn about next week for asynchronous tools or learning, for example, office hours. And we'll also go into a little bit about uh, OneNote as well. This recording will be available uh, for you guys to take a look at. Um, I believe it might have started a little late, but I don't think uh, I don't think all the content was missed, so you'll have an access to the, this recording, which I will send to the um, to the UIW team uh, as soon as this the session is done. All right, and then online instruction files you can actually access um, if you go to support.office.com. You can actually take a training course in all of all of these um, uh, items that you see here. All right, so I'm also going to ask your, uh, a favor from all of you to please take this survey here. Um, this survey is very important for us to, to gauge you know, how this session went and if you got something from it. 
and we'd really appreciate it if you went and take this survey. So go ahead and take a picture of that QR code. It should automatically open up a forms item within your phone or within your computer. And I would definitely appreciate it if you all could take the survey and let us know how it went today. Uh, we appreciate all the feedback. Awesome, if there are no more questions, I'll stick around for two more minutes, but it was a pleasure uh, teaching you guys today about some synchronous tool tools within the Office ecosystem. And on behalf of the Microsoft team here in California, thank you so much. And I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon and evening. Thank you, Dr. Ramona. Thank you.